In my lecture titled Mother India in Modern Indian Art, a Representational Strategies in Modern and Contemporary Indian Art, I present a series of artists who are dead and gone, some of, our, some of them are alive, but whose work remain as a way of posthumous life, as pointers of, uh, for, for us to navigate in the dense and vast sea of contemporary culture. The word representation has different meanings in different contexts. Etymological roots reveal the word representation is all about bring something before or exhibit an image. In political parlance, the meaning is slightly different. It means personify or objectify, for objectify a set of ideas and values through a person or a thing, like we elect an MLA or MP or something like that. In art also, an image becomes a representation of ideas and values. Ideas and values are not decontextualized entities or a vacuum. The represented image or object carries not only the ideas and values, but also the times and spaces or in general, the physical as well as the intellectual context that they have, that have given birth to such ideas and, ideas and values. That means ideas reproduce the context. A representative image is a condensed version of times, spaces, ideas, values and attitude. We always say that we wear our attitude. If I am sporting a beard, if somebody is sporting a beard, that means he has a certain attitude. Somebody has a, a certain way of a haircut or a certain way of dressing. Generally, people say that when you have it, show it or flaunt it. So, so we wear our attitude. A represented image is the biography of the representative, means the person who makes that representation and that of his, his, or, or, his or her time and space. And uh, we know that uh, biographies, so we can say that these are the biography of the times. When we make a painting, it is also the biography, not only of the, 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 the writer or the painter, but also of the time in which that painting or poetry is created. Biographies visibilize, you must be familiar with this word, make visible, visibilize. You know, uh, Microsoft Word search engine may not be showing that visibilize of, as of now. Bruno Latho, the, the new French, French, not new, he's 72 years old, he's a French philosopher who talks about the, uh, you know, he, he's called a science historian, you know. So he talks about the series of actors and actants working within the historical process. So the actor network, he calls, could bring the relationship between uh, between the uh, speaking in the context of art, in the case of art, the artist and the art objects that she or he has used for representing ideas and values. Anyway, now I am using the trope of or the metaphor of Mother India as a representation of our country itself. India is not a pater land pater as in the Latin uh, word, it's not a fatherland. We have this motherland concept, it's a major land. Unlike the Europeans, we have a motherland, not a fatherland. Seeing earth or land as a female entity in the part of this oriental culture, in, in, in the case of the oriental culture, oriental cultures are always treat, treat land as female, feminine gender. And especially in the, la in the Indian subcontinent, there has been this tendency to equate women and land, mannam, pennam. Hmm? Besides, like in the many cultures all over the world, the creative source of anything is considered to be uh, feminine in India also. The polytheistic regions, religions perhaps must have disallowed the domination of a single male godhead in the religious narratives of India. I mean, that could be a conjecture saying that like maybe we have so many gods, Muppati Mukkodi, 33,000, 33 crores or something like that. So that many uh, gods and goddesses we have, so we don't allow one patriarchal male god to dominate. Be the reason like we are looking at our land as uh, a feminine land. And Benedict and, so sorry, the sharing of the common cultural narratives through folklore and epics become, became instrumental imagine, in, in imagining a nation uh, that would later become India. So we need to have a kind of a common cultural, uh, you know, sharing, cultural imagination to imagine our country as India or any other country. You know, we need something. So that is a Benedict Anderson's concept. 
like he speaks about like uh, nations are constituted by imagined communities you need ramayana or mahabharata like you can go to manipur you can go to goa you can go to the kanyakumari or kashmir and talk about sita rama lakshmana and uh, you know bhima and all so people will understand i mean that is the one reason that in single imagination one whole population or a populace could be you know uh, bound together that means communities share a common imagination that binds the people morally ethically and culturally in such a, such a scenario it is easy to exercise political imagination to bind people that is why this ayodhya ram janmabhoomi uh, etc etc so you can you you can you can actually project one particular religious imagination to say that uh, this is our india and we should be fighting for it that means communities share this common imagination uh making a land into a set. so you need co- co- uh, you need a kind of shared imagination to change convert a land into a nation and it definitely so india was imagined as a woman from the very beginning of the nationalist st- sentiments that was propped up against the british raj in india you know this anandam matha that was written by bengim chandra chatterjee in 1882 there there is a protagonist satyananda another protagonist who is who who would like to become a, a you know fire spitting nationalist and satyananda takes mahendra to the, a particular room and it shows three types of mother india one is jagadhatri the second is durga third is kali so these are the three imaginations three visual imagination but in you have to understand in ananda mad in the novel they say only jagadhatri jagadhatri means the thatri of jagat that means the mother of the world he bangim chandra chatterjee does not say that uh, she is bharat mata instead she says she is jagadhatri so jagadhatri durga and the last one is kali this is kali as you know this is a raja ravi varma oleograph we will come to that later so these three uh, three symbols as mother india comes up only in late 19th century that is 1882 by bengit chandra chatterjee not as a visual form not in visual form but in a literary form so you have to imagine for yourself and also these three uh, ima- images or three uh, literary images show three gunas sattva rajas tamas satvika gunam rajo gunam that means the royal uh, kingly warrior the kind and the tamo means tamas means like the darker forces so all these things three things combined together uh, gives birth to the mother india concept but bengin chandra chatterjee was not writing about india per se he was actually writing about bengal so bengal is not india but by virtue of british raj having the capital having calcutta as the capital they could say that this is or the, the or bengit chandra chatterjee or the generally uh, the bengalis could say that this is india so because they could bind india into one this common imagination of kali durga kali jagadatri etc the mythical bharat was adaptable it was an adaptable prop for any presidency under the british raj and could represent the rest of the raj we have to remember that in the late 19th century calcutta was the capital of the british raj so there was no problem for claiming bengal as the bharat as bharat mata and adopting a subcontinental upanishadic tantric goddess for representational purpose this is a tantric image like in in certain uh, representations of kali especially you could see a uh, a shiva like now the shiva is actually lying with her with his you know uh, that paraphernalia of uh, serpents and uh, all around but in some of them you can see a copulating shiva and shakti a nude copulating shiva and shakti right under the feet of uh, kali so the tantric uh, sexual tantric erotic uh, ima- imagination also used to come but here it is not that obvious oh, definitely raja ravurma was the painter so you could you could always see some kind of a moral sense of self censorship in his in his works let me tell you why i have chosen this subject today india is at the crossroads politically socially and economically 
A pessimist would say that India is in a degenerative phase. An optimist in me says that this too shall pass and we shall overcome. You know what I am trying to, uh, you know, come to. I am talking about this draconian CAA and uh, N NCR, NPR, etc., etc. Surprisingly, and for the relief of all the citizens in India, I skip certain areas. Uh, surprisingly, for the relief of all the citizens in India, the polarization has not happened in the religious lines. Even today, you can understand all these fights, protests, etc., etc. It is not clearly demarcated into Hindu or Muslim. It is not divided into religious lines. So that gives us hope. And the right-wing forces had expected the country to split along the lines of religion to make this country belong to one dominant religion, rendering the rest of the people who belong to different faiths secondary citizens. But against this move, of the central government people have been standing up next one so you can understand that why i am talking about bharat mata and now we are seeing a lot of bharat matas out there perhaps we will not accept them as bharat mata because they don't fit into the kind of dominant imagination that would render a sort of bharat mata which is already in our minds that's what i'm trying to say here the women came out in, uh, uh, to stage in uh, stage sit-ins in different parts of the country. Even in Trivandrum, you can see Shaheen Bath is the pioneering space, and uh, today we have several Shaheen Baths all over India. These women, if at all they need to be called anything, should be called Bharat Mata because Bharat Mata was an image primarily conceived by writers and artists to encapsulate the feminine force that could stand up against the British Raj. However, as I mentioned before, the idea of Bharat Mata too was not value-free and devoid of any ideological underpinnings. The Bharat Mata and that the artist conceived has, has been pre predominantly Hindu and in many ways the cultural representation has influenced most of the Indians. It, is, it, it may be fortunate or it may be unfortunate. Maybe Everybody, whenever you talk about a Bharat Mata, it is always a Hindu Bharat Mata. Only, see, maybe Shaheen Bagh, you know, that predominantly Muslim populated area, 80% or something Muslim populated area. But, and, and you don't know, like, how many Muslims are there in this gathering. You don't know how many Muslims, Muslim women. You may say that, like, everyone is cover, covering their heads with the headscarves or saris, pallus, etc., etc., but that is not just the reason that we can't say that they are all Muslims. You have to understand that Delhi is going through a winter, a severe winter. And covering the head is done even by uh, the, the Hindu women. They, they have to use the, the cover. And also, if you go to Gujarat, you can see a lot of girls wearing their face, covering their face and the hands. They are not using burqa, but they are just covering their face by there is severe heat wave. So they want to protect their skin. So, so you can't say that the, the, the predominant Hindu, uh, we, Bharat Mata is predominantly Hindu. So as we know that initial unrest against the British India had a religious undertones and overtones. The first independent struggle in 1857, which is called a Sepoy mutiny, mutiny by the British historians, had it taken place on the religious lines. And they have a religious reason. The Hindu soldiers in the British army rebelled because they did not want to bite open the bullet cases coated with grease made out of cow fat. So that, that was the first reason for, we call it independent struggle, but it was there, there was a Hindu reason behind it. Within three decades, Indian National Congress came to existence in Mumbai in 1885, 1857, first Sepoy Mutani or the, the first uh, what you call the first independent struggle. Indian National Congress come to existence in 1885. And by that time, by 1893, after that, Bal Gangadhar Tilak actually asked the Hindu people to do Ganesh festival in a big way to consolidate the Hindu vote or the Hindu sentiments against the British. I mean, I'm not talking about the Hindu sentiments against the Muslim but Hindu sentiments against British. So that means the nationalist sentiments were predominantly Hindu. That was in 1893. 
ഇന്ത്യൻ നാഷണൽ കോൺഗ്രസ് കെയിം അപ്പ് അഗേൻസ്റ്റ് ദിസ് പർട്ടിക്കുലർ സോഷ്യോ പൊളിറ്റിക്കൽ ബാക്ക് ഡ്രോപ്പ് ആൻഡ് ഒബ്വിയസ്ലി ഇറ്റ് കുഡൻറ്റ് ഹാവ് ബീൻ എനിതിങ് ബട്ട് ഹിന്ദു ഇൻ നേച്ചർ ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് വൈ വി ടുഡേ സി ദാറ്റ് ലൈക്ക് വി ഹാവ് എ വെരി തിന്നിങ് യു നോ ഇമേജ് ഓഫ് കോൺഗ്രസ് കോൺഗ്രസ് ഇസ് ആക്ച്വലി മെൽറ്റിംഗ് ഡൗൺ വൈ ബിക്കോസ് കോൺഗ്രസ് വട്ട് യു കോൾ കോൺഗ്രസ് ബേസ് ഇസ് വാസ് ആൻഡ് സ്റ്റിൽ ഈസ് ഹിന്ദു ഇൻ നേച്ചർ we have to understand that even the indian national congress despite having the word national in it was limited to bombay in the beginning it was a bombay party mahatma gandhi when he came to you know work in india he called it as a gathering of highly paid advocates wakils party that he used to call it and he opened it up and, and kerala pradesh congress committee that is kpcc that came into existence only in 1921 so we also didn't have any nationalism till 90 1921 we see the dates of the establishment of rashtriya swayam sang swayam sevak sang that is rss that is 1925 and the communist party of india again 1925 and some people dispute actually 1924 1925 so congress kpcc rss swayam sevak sang everything even communist party every political movements happening almost the same time and the larger cultural backdrop or the religious backdrop was predominantly hindu so that is where we come to this uh, what you call the, the visual narrative uh, <clears throat> to understand the national sentiments in various ideological complexes to, 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 to it took shape almost in the same time all the political uh, you know deliberations the struggles started happening at the same time it would be interesting to look at the formation of the of, of a potent symbol for representing the newly formed ideas about indian nationalism so now i come to uh, i will just skip a few areas and come to interesting little the 19th century apart from the reference of bharat mata in anand mart which was definitely a literal reference we do, we do not have any evidence of bharat mata in the indian mother in our provincial visual cultures i say provincial because as you know by now we did not have any india till 1858 because in 1857 the first sepoy mutiny happened and british raj or british government in england they said enough is enough they took the power from english east india company and they they, they brought india into dire, under direct governance so that happened in 1858 once again there were not cons- so but there they were not even remotely considered representative of indian so the next one next next slide so before that even before uh, a mother india came into being we had this 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 kind of uh, kali uh, next one durga even before anandamat we had this Uh, these images but they were never called bharat mata the first time we are hearing it in bengim chandra chatterjee sanand mart but these were already there but never bharat mata once again they were not considered as indian mothers because there was no political india till then why they were not called bharat mata because there was no india there, there was no political india then one may argue about the existence of a, the, of a great india citing the references of from ancient texts calling india as aryavarta jambu dwipa bharat varsha etc but there was no india per se but with the more soft more, more sophisticated historical tools today in our hands we should be able to see them as geographical imagination or rather latent cultural cartographic desires birth out of the temporal military gains and a territorializing through military terrains the 16th century navigational maps created by the european show the general landman landmass identified as india but never as a politically cohesive country with a clear geographical boundaries in the modern sense you can see in the 16th century and the 17th century so many cartographic advancements or experiments happening or many people trying to create maps there is there is a writing that india that particular landmass is called india but it is not the political india you can see it as a geographical area but it is never a political india this is where raja ravi verma come in, come into the scene
like he was born in 1848 and he died in 1906 that is 19 uh, 19 1906 and uh, he was born in kilimanur i am i am just skipping the biographical details because you are familiar with uh travancore history shows that uh, divan mathava rao relieved himself of the services of travancore and then went to take up the prime ministerial position in the in the in the, uh, the country or the or the kingdom of baroda in 1880 mathava rao invited raja ravi verma and uh, raja raja verma to the baroda court so raja ravi verma was painting uh, indian gods and goddesses from the baroda court that was his one of his first exposure exposures to the outer world and uh, historian not an art historian geeta kapoor uh, says that he raja ravi verma was in a fix actually raja ravi verma was between the victorian moralities and the indian traditional you know uh, traditional moralities he had to be a modern in terms of victorian painting style and he had to depend thematically he had to depend on indian puranas etc so he was in a sort of fix but st- still ravi verma is hailed as a painter who gave human faces to the indian gods and goddesses as i mentioned before the artistic representations of indian pantheon were often were were often generic and also had textual connotations codifications to be to be pursued by the artists people understood the godhead not by looking at the face but by the attributes and the shapes depicted in the form of the textual uh, directions see nobody says that it is durga durga has this many hands it, it, this many limbs etc etc but the textual references by reading the text you understand that okay this could be durga like that so there was no particular because one artist may paint like this another artist from another region may paint a totally different durga so that was the condition like there was no particular durga at that time so devi verma more like say, more, was more like a christian in this matter and because he gave human faces to the gods and goddesses and made them familiar as if they were the next door guys and girls you know why i am saying that like uh, uh, he he was like a christian because in christianity or in the western aesthetics Uh, there is there, there is a there, there is a dictum or there is a there is a saying that like uh, uh, god created man out of his own image so, ma- so therefore man created god in his own image so there is a kind of mutuality there is a kind of mutual reproduction so uh, if if the god is created in uh, sorry if the human being is created or adam was created in the god's image the naturally indian gods also should be like a human being because god is a human being so that was the kind of logic perhaps raja ravi verma used and it has more interest interesting nuances to follow there is an interesting irony involved in this observation on the one hand he was a christian because he made gods in the forms and guise of men and women bible says that the god created man in his form that means a perfect representation of a human being is next to the next to the perfect representation of godhead that is why in the classical era we see the corporeal perfection in the sculptures or paintings which later became the benchmark for the european renaissance so this is a painting by michelangelo in the sistine chapel birth of adam or god giving birth to adam so the perfection of the human body if you have a few, very perfect human uh, 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 figure or a human physique you are next to god that is why vivekananda said that you should have a perfect body the proliferation of gyms all over with with vivekananda actually is because of this reason like when you have a, a per- perfect body you are close to the god you know so anyway in a way ravi verma was cleverly inverting this idea by giving the gods the shapes and forms of ordinary human beings so here he was giving god a very special status because god is held by uh, you know angels and so on and he has a huge flowing beard so god was something special but what devi verma did he made these gods and goddesses into very ordinary human beings and not simply ordinary human beings something more to it we will come to that anyway so on the other so the on the on the uh, in a way ravi verma was cleverly inverting 
On the other hand, the familiarity in the depiction of the gods and goddesses, unlike the European experiences pertaining to it, did not breed contempt among the people. On the contrary, they lapped them up as if it had never happened before. Like when gods and goddesses, goddesses were depicted in the human guise or human form or ordinary people's form, people were not taken aback. Instead, they embraced it. Perhaps they didn't know something else. There is a reason. So here is a Lakshmi. You can, you can, I don't know whether you will seriously identify some living human being or not. But in those days, these, they were living human beings. We will come to that later. So, so here is a Lakshmi and here is a Saraswati. And nobody, nobody told him, nobody told Raja Yurma that like a Saraswati should be having uh, a Veena like held like a sitar or, some, sitar or something like that. It was all his imagination. And next. But what I was trying to say that when ordinary people are depicted as gods and goddesses, people started worshipping these gods and goddesses because they were in the calendars, oleographs, etc. etc. But in the West, in 1863, this painting created such a furor, hue and cry. Why? Because it, 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 it is painted by an impressionist painter called Edward Manet, a French painter, French impressionist. And this became scandalous. This painting became very blasphemous and it was taken away from the saloon, uh, the exhibition. Why? It offended the sentiments of the people. There is something called the sentiments hurtitis. That means the easily hurtable sentiments. So the people, especially in India today, we have a, a easily you know, hurting sentiments, etc. So here, the French people, generally they are familiar with the nudes and all. It is nothing, nothing special. That is why... Uh, I think Linda Nochlin, Linda Nochlin, uh, a feminist theorist, a theoretician, she raised this question that uh, why there are no great Indian women, great women artists, one, one question. The second thing, she proved that like almost 90% of the nudes in the uh, nudes, female, female nudes in the uh, museums of the world are painted by men, not by women. But this actually scandalized the people. This actually created a scandal. Why? Because they understood that these two gentlemen are okay because they are fully clad and nude women nude female figures were there in the painting that was not a big problem but they found something scandalous because they could identify these two women they were these two women were normal ordinary sex workers in the paris parisian streets so they thought that art is a very polished and very, very, what you call the polite class, you know, the gentle class business where sex workers and uh, prostitutes were not invited. They were not welcome. So why this artist painted these women? Today it is very na normal and natural. We can show it in an academic circle or even in the public we can show. Nobody gets scandalized. But that time... The Parisian population, Parisian people thought that this was scandalous because these two women were prostitutes, uh, sex workers. They were not allowed to enter into the polite circle of art even as an image. Interestingly, Raja Rivarma also used the sex workers to create Lakshmi and the Saraswati. But we had never had a problem because we never knew they were because now art history proves that they were sex workers and or or, or tawaif and all you, you you call them like you know the singing and dancing girls etc anyway the irony become more nuanced and intriguing when we see how familiarity of the images uh, the, the images of the people who have been depicted in the paintings could cause scandal i i, I discussed this so revivarma's case it is curious in this context because he painted gods and goddesses as entities or being with the look of ordinary human beings. We always say that Raja Devarma's contribution is this, that he depicted Indian gods and goddesses in the human form for the first time in the world history or India's history. We call it a great thing. Primarily, he did the paintings of Lakshmi, Saraswati and so on for the patrons. We saw that. Their currency in the society increased as Ravi Verma established chromo lithography in Bombay and later in Lonavala in late 1890s and made the oleographic prints available for the public consumption. It is recorded that Ravi Verma wanted his works, 
especially the paintings of goddess and goddess, gods and goddesses reach each quote unquote hindu household in the country for a few annas he did succeed in his mission because everybody started buying here we have to notice that devi verma never called any of his works as bharat mata devi verma never said that i am painting bharat mata that is one good thing that he did and he called as saraswati a saraswati calling like a spade a spade saraswati a saraswati lakshmi a lakshmi he never said that this is something else he gave them human faces but their bodies were fashioned in the neo classical model if you look at them like you can say that like uh, uh, botticelli painted the venus birth of venus etc so the, you can see the the contours in that way they were clad exotically according to the sartorial standards of that time and uh, raja devarma is credited with the fashioning the way today women are wearing sari you have to understand raja devarma actually actually made indian women, women to wear sari the way you are wearing today because he was very much fond of the nauvari sari nauvari sari means the 9 meter sari which the maharashtri maharashtrians were wearing and he re cut he reduced it into like the 6 meter today uh, so this is a sort of nauvari sari actually actually dupika chawla in his in her studies raja devarma as a colonial painter clearly says that uh, ravi verma helped or fashioned like we say that our sadhya with all this uh, engineering and all those things was fashioned by uh, sri narayana guru to create a kind of unified sadhya thing in kerala so similarly if sri narayana guru created sadhya or fashioned sadhya daja rivarma could be uh, the person who actually designed how women wear contemporary women wear sarees he literally uh, you know fashioned it anyway he gave them sartorial standards of the day. the limbs and the attributes were as per the textual directions like uh, this multiple limbs as a whole these gods and goddesses goddesses were uh, familiar people but with but made unfamiliar by the location and the attributes so actually uh, the when 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 we call it like uh, unfamiliar by locations and attributes unfamiliar unfamiliarity is because that uh, who told you that saraswati is sitting in a remote uh, sylvan landscape on a rock and saraswati what what is she doing there exactly if lakshmi is standing on a lotus and we definitely there is a poetic uh, what you call poetic license you know building suspension of disbelief that how can a saraswati some 70 kilos uh, you know woman standing very coolly on a tender uh, lotus flower anyway so those things so, uh, yeah <clears throat> so he made these things familiar through sort of inducing sort of unfamiliarity or vice versa now who were these people that revi ruma modeled his gods and goddesses after history gives some uncanny but indisputable leads that perhaps would offend the easily hurting sentiments of the right wing people today we can say it here but maybe if we go out and say that lakshmi is so and so riverma was fond of a few women in bombay this is this is one woman he was a, she was a singer anjani bai malpekar is her name riverma was fond of a few women in bombay whom uh, some were having dubious reputation dubious reputation we we know what 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 is the dubious reputation i am not inclined to say that riverma was having illicit or clandestine affairs with these women this film makers have this problem film makers always depict a uh, depict depict an artist having loose morals not loose morals or loose moral moral the women always get attracted to artists or something like that if a woman comes to model suddenly that she becomes the uh, concubine or uh, you know uh, keep or something like that a mistress or something like that i think sandosh shivan or sangeet shivan did a film on raja ravi verma Kedan Mehta did a movie. There also, Raja Ravi Verma is always into uh, women, or oh, sort of sort of thing. You know, like that is a kind of popular imagination. Uh, anyway, he was not into that. I am not going to say that. I, I am not going to offend the Kalimanur Kovilagam or Travancore household, so, you know, uh, royal house. To say that uh, Raja Ravi Verma had illicit affairs. I am not going to say that. But he knew these women, and he used to sketch these women. Anjani Bai Malpoker, whenever she she used to sing. this guy used to sit and portray her and these portraits will become the face of gods and goddesses later and 
in the conventional sense uh, but during her music recitals devi verma used to sketch her there was another lady rajbai mulgaonkar her name is rajbai mulgaonkar another another uh, woman who she is an impresario maybe art lover anyway who came and modeled for raja devi verma and also her sister Ra this rajbai mulgaonkar mulgaonkar's sister besides some of the paintings we would see rajbai's younger sister modeling then in some of the some of the paintings we will see even devi verma's eldest daughter uh, this is devi verma's eldest daughter mahaprabha devi verma thought that uh, his daughter had this perfect woman's body or woman's demeanor or uh, posture or beauty this is a recent calendar maybe through whatsapp you must have got it like uh, uh all the all the raja rivarma paintings were recreated by some uh, photographer called gautam rao and uh, or shobhana actually is enacting us and i think like she is perfect she belongs to this travancore sisters genes run <laughs> into their blood anyway so and here uh, there are a lot of other other areas to discuss about this painting but i am not going to uh, get into that but raja rivarma had this tendency to use live models to pose for him okay so we have to understand lakshmi and saraswati were not swayambhus that he just sat and you know one fine morning i got the first line then i started writing the novel no not not kind he contemplate the on the real persons okay it is so interesting to see that revi verma chose to work with another lady who could be called variously called sugandhi this is in the popular imagination there was one sugandhi for making the paintings of lakshmi and saraswati so sugandhi was definitely a call girl and he used not anjani anjani bhai malpekar bhai malpekar or rajbai mulgaonkar instead she he used the sugandhi definitely for making the portraits or the paintings of lakshmi and saraswati so this is scandalous actually but didn't didn't become scandal at all and the the day or now we worship like these calendars or this pictures in our puja rooms actually we are worshiping a lady sugandhi or anjani bhai mal mal malpekar and all so somehow we actually overlook that fact and uh, maybe the pro maybe the proliferated oleograph did not carry the identity and the story behind the painting when we get the pictures of saraswati and lakshmi we don't know who these women were so we just okay tk that is the attitude okay then besides devi verma's paintings were lauded by people like bal gangadhar tilak bal gangadhar tilak actually he, he used to be supposedly the first hindu leader before head gavar and all uh, he in his uh, in his newspaper called the kesari not the kesari balakrishna pilla kesari the old hindu kesari in that kesari he lauded he actually appreciated that devi verma was doing something great for indian culture held it together to to give <laughs> some weight to my presentation okay you know anyway we are coming to a close anyway so so he lauded them hence we could deduce of that after bengim chandra chatterjee bharat mata we have uh, bengim chandra chatterjee is bharat mata we have revi verma's bharat mata by default Lakshmi and Saraswati by default becomes Bharat Mata. We will come to that. We will come to that in a in a shocking revelation. We will connect to it now. Uh, his oleographs cheaply proliferated in the bazaars carried with with them not only the idea of hither to non-existent in gods and goddesses, uh, but also the political message that it tagged along due to the extraneous endorsement that came from the Hindu nationalistic sentiments. So Raja Rivarma became the indisputable Hindu painter because of the extra extraneous endorsements that he got. Rivarma gets the credit of creating Bharat Matas by default, and and the or the right wingers actually uh, you know uh, like praised it, and things just doesn't uh, didn't stop there. He also get the credit of having devised a human cartographic image. Next one. so maybe india never had a political map before raja rivarma i mean i'm i'm just actually uh, making a kind of very tall claim but still for art history sake i would say that this was the first indian political map expressed through cultural images so you can see 11 women with different 
a musical instruments sitting in one single frame and uh, nobody posed for him he actually picked up these women different occasions and he created a mental photoshop i always say that he must have created a mental photoshop in doing this thing so these women are from different regions rajaruma used to travel so he got the idea that kerala kilimanur is not the simple country the travancore country is not the country alone there is mysore there is bombay there is calcutta there is baroda so many places so he could gather the samples of these women their sartorial preferences their uh, you know their ornaments their uh, way of tying their hair their clothes etc etc and he brought them together saying that this could be a way of representing one uh, unified india in a pictorial way so maybe this this could be called a bharat mata combined together it's a collective bharat mata but uh, he was not just doing out of his spur or something like that next one in 1950 ramaswami naikar another painter who was in the travancore court he had already done something like that but the dif- what you can clearly make out the difference the difference is this that these were all uh, travancore household people like they 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 are the mothers and sisters etc etc but the other one is clearly india that is a family so this the, this particular work is called the galaxy of musicians and this is done in 1884 and you have to understand that previously i said 1885 congress indian national congress came into being so the way we portray raja ravirma as a novice or something like that and a, a, a guy who only delved into into art and related things he was just a fine artist without knowing any business or uh, politics no ravirma knew very well what is happening around but he was looking he was there he has he had an innate business tendency so he was constantly looking for patrons so he traveled and he knew the country was slowly changing and 1905 was a watershed year for india so in this 1905 you know lord curzon divided bengal into two into like west bengal and east bengal there was a huge uh, you know political unrest and this is the year abhinindranath tagore created this painting and for the first time some mata was attributed to a particular image and this is that image it is called banga mata means bengal mother banga mata painted in 1905 exactly after the the bengal partition abhinindranath tagore means who belongs to the tagore family who was also the first teacher of shanti niketan established by rabindranath tagore so abhinindranath tagore did this banga mata mata later it became it got absorbed or adopted into the larger narrative of indian uh, political struggle or indian nationality struggle and its name slowly turned into bharat mata now if you google bharat mata this image will come primarily this image will come so and you can see this bharat mata has the same thing same attributes like revyurmas bharat mata or revyurmas lakshmi and saraswati four limbs and you know who is the model for this her name is margaret noble and who is margaret noble who later on came to know as sister nivedita next uh, yeah this one so this this particular image if you look at this image and the lakshmi saraswati or any other image of uh, devi varma there is a marked difference and what is that marked difference that difference is that uh, devi varma's images are sexually charming and sexually charged images they are voluptuous they are like erotic in nature at some point they are erotic as well but here in abhinindranath tagore's uh, uh, bharat mata she is desexualized she is asexual i would i wouldn't say asexual but she is desexualized deliberately because she the model is uh, what you call a sister nivedita and she is desexualized in multiple counts first of all she is given this attire of uh, a, a sadhu a monk she is given the saffron uh, attire and she is having that japamala that rosary in her hand 
and she is holding something a white cloth the white cloth actually represents the the purity the virginity of the land it is a virgin land as a pure land and you know the purity and the virginity are the burdens of women not of men so bharata mata also carries this phenomenal burden or the perennial burden of being uh, a, a celibate or something like that you know she has to be a celibate and then she is she is you know india was in 1905 india was not industrialized so she is depending heavily on the agrarian economy that is the the, the sheaf of uh, you know paddy in her hand and she is very erudite she is a very scholarly and she is holding that uh, uh, that uh, that uh, palm uh, leaves of scriptures so this this is a clearly defined bharat mata and by this i would say that uh, uh, it is a clear political statement as well which is which could be underlined as a hindu it is not the the, the, the stress is not just about uh, it being or she being bharat mata but it is all about her this this lady being an ideal indian woman also an ideal indian woman should have these these tendencies you know which which will go back to you know the definitions of women or definition of uh, a woman will go back to perhaps to manusmriti etc etc like what is her role etc but here when she becomes bharat mata she has a defined role as a pure 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 pure, pure woman abhinandanath tagore painting painted a new bharat mata to reiterate a new kind of nationalism and was definitely seeking india's cultural resources in the recent and the remote past overlooking the interim british period bharat mata was originally banga mata i anyway i said all these things and the fervent years that followed the bengal partition in 1905 somehow did not focus completely on bharat mata the european modernist movement in art was showing their glimpses in indian art as well with the advent of socialist and communist ideas coming out of the israel soviet union also brought in certain amount of social realism in indian art so this is like in 1930s and in 1950s you could see ram kinkar beige making this famous sculptures like uh, sandal family and the milk call this is this particular work is called milk call you can see two women rushing towards the mill mill means factory that also different from the agrarian economy also the transition from the agrarian economy to a factory based industrial economy this particular work being called milk call because the the time frame or the time idea is complete was completely changed people's life were controlled by the call of the mill the siren of the mill today you punch at that time it was siren call the if you look at the first opening shot of modern times by charlie chaplin you can see a host of bowler hats actually rushing into a frame so the people were like turning into like uh, you know uh, what you go assembly line makers or something like that so here you can see uh, a totally different figuration coming into indian art in ramkinkar beige and also that is not just european which is coming even from the socialist realism of uh, uh, you know uh, soviet union the it's well um, so ussr so this this particular work in 1934 uh, a sculpture a socialist realistic sculpture must have definitely influenced damkinger beige in making uh, you know uh, this milk call so you can you can see the the movement the force the attitude everything is the same yeah next so now we have another artist in 1930s that is amrita shergil she was she was extensively traveling in india ha huh. i will say this also amrita shergil was the daughter of a of an impresario an italian woman mary antonietti and her father was on sardar ji uh, i forgot his name uh, he was a sikh so that is why in, there was a question like uh, who were the parents of uh, amrita shergil in fine arts college there was a question so they wrote the fine arts college students generally they don't study anything so they wrote that uh, amrita shergil was a great artist her uh, her her mother was a hungarian hmm? her mother was hungry and the father was sick <laughs> so so she was born to a kind of <laughs> very sad family but no she was a hungarian she was a, uh, she, her mother was a hungarian and the father was sick and uh, she extensively traveled in 1930s and painted indian women not bharat mata 
but indian women as the, 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 she went to himachal pradesh painted the hill women this particular is women from, work is called the hill women this women from hills and next one this is tk padmini uh, amrita sharma died in 1940 1941 tk padmini was born if uh, Amrita Shergil had died in 1941, we would have said that like TK Padmini is the rebirth of Amrita Shergil. One year difference, so we don't, <laughs> in art history, we don't say this. Anyway, TK Padmini was actually doing a lot of uh, lot, lot of uh, paintings for the first time in India, the, the in a painterly way, a woman's imagination about a woman, TK Padmini. But she also died in 1969, in childbirth she died. So she was painting, not Bharat Mata. She was also looking at the whole Indian, Indian independence struggle, etc. But she was not painting any Bharat Mata. Next one. Yeah. But then now we have another Bharat Mata coming up in 1950s, which is Mahabub Khan's this particular movie where Nargis did acted as Mother India. So literally Mother India making a staging a coming back. Interesting thing. Raja Rivurma, Abhinindranath Tagore, these two people were Hindu, you can say Hindu, uh, technically speaking, Abhinindranath Tagore was not Hindu, you know, they, they belonged to this Bhadra logo who were beyond the, the Hindu, you know, strictures, etc. So, uh, but here Nargis Dutt, Nargis, Nargis was a Muslim woman and the director is, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mahabub now, now and the lyricist, uh, I mean, music is by Naushan. So, you can see a whole lot of uh, Muslims making the Indian Muslims like because it is post independence. So the Indian Muslims, those uh, the quote unquote Indian Muslims making uh, that is quite unfortunate to say that uh, we have to call our brothers and sisters Indian Muslims. You know, we don't call Indian Hindus. So it is unfortunate. But anyway, so we have the, another Mother India coming in uh, this particular time. I, I'm coming to a close. The rise of right-wing forces in India became very palpable with the demolition of Babri Masjid on 6th of December 1992. Yen Pushpamana, she is a Bangalore-based artist, did a series of works questioning the right-wing tendencies in India. As a strategy that she used was spoofing the aesthetics of Raja Devi Verma and Abhinindranath Tagore. You can see that here Abhinindranath Tagore was actually basing his work on Sister Nivedda. Here, Pushpamala actually modeling Mother India's image to create a performative parody where she becomes Mother India. And in, in, in real life, she does not endorse Mother India. So it is, it's, it's a sort of masquerading. The, the nationalism, the nationalist sentiments that you nurture or practice in a day-to-day -day life is all about acting it out, not really... Uh, not really uh, heartfelt or something like that. So she is sh showing that 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 minute gap or even a uh, widening gap between what you are and what you act out in the public spaces. So she is criticizing it that by transporting herself into the forms of the established canons of Bharat Mata by the pioneering artist um, Pushpamala made a double subversion of Bharat Mata image approved and hailed by the patriarchal society in India. Through this deliberate performative act of masquerading, once again she brought back the memories of both Raja Rivarma and Abhinindranath Tagore using mortal women as the models for portraying the sublime and the ideal. So it's a double sub subversion because Raja Rivarma also without understanding because if he was living here today, Raja Rivarma and using some call girls, for example, an, a, a former call girl like Nalini Jamila you know, uh, becoming the model of Raja Rivarma to, to, to portray a goddess, a godhead, it will actually, you know, even Raja Rivarma, uh, Raja Rivarma studio will be burnt, his works will be burnt. That is what exactly happened with Emma Hussain. Emma Hussain, actually he was just following Raja Rivarma. He was as, show, as showman, uh, uh, an artist, just like Raja Rivarma, you know. So, Emma uh, Hussain was actually attacked because of his religious identity. But here, uh, Pushpamala perhaps get away with it uh, because she has the Hindu Hindu name with her. Today, Bharat Mada comes in various guises. So here, you can see that early Kali, that is also Pushpamala. Pushpamala performing as Kali. Because an artist need not necessarily be painting all the time. She could or he could perform. She could use her own body. 
you must be asking that why many performance artists are women why because they have the easiest tool or the most most rightful tool with them that is their body they need not go to the shop to buy canvas they don't need to get endorsed by anybody else there is always a question that male or the men ask the women artists when they do some nudes i told you that in the beginning all the nudes were done by the female nudes were done by the male artist and when women started doing their own nudes auto self self nudes or self portraits men started asking you people are also doing the same thing you were criticizing men for doing it now you are criticizing you are doing the same thing but there is a difference there is a marked difference the difference is that when men do a female nude portrait they are actually taking the ownership of that body with or without her consent they are objectifying they are making her an object but when women do their nudes when they paint their own bodies naked they are reclaiming the body that is what the theoreticians like carol dungan has particularly used this 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 this, this word reclaiming it was somebody else's and now reclaiming if you if I, anybody in this world has the right to portray me as nude and that is me only me not you that is the 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 the, the message that women give women artists give so it is not necessary that you should be painting or sculpting all the time you could perform so pushpamara was performing and she was showing the same it is start from banding chandra chatterjee with jagadhatri durga and kali and she performs it in the 21st century pushpamala as lakshmi with using the stage props and that there also there is a counter reference because uh, raja ravi verma also used the stage properties and because he was very fond of parsi theater so she uses the same thing to create a contemporary lakshmi sitting there among the props she reads out indian constitution or certain strictures etc this is so you can see that like when she reads she needs to use her uh, specs so uh, she has to uh, wearing all these things she has to read you know so that uh, this this laughter this this mild laughter that you you laughed now that is exactly the thing she wants to create like a huge godhead is suddenly brought down and the, the, that narrative is collapsed into something very mundane and very uh, subversive in that sense subversive now today we have so many uh, you know performances like that in school right from the fancy dress competition to so many other things but you have to understand the bharat mata comes from that imagination of abhinindranath sorry uh, bangam chandra chatterjee raja devi verma abhinindranath tagore and the so many others that we have seen in repetitive repetitive and repeated reproductions of uh, images created by all these people especially raja devi verma this you can see that like that girl is holding the indian national flag so she belongs to that jagadhatri you know like she is okay the next one so there the, with the trident coming in the trishul coming in the meaning completely changes the bharatam mata becomes slightly aggressive this is so if you ask any child to in the school like what to, to paint a bharatam mata your country basically you port, go and portray like this you can see the the earlier uh, earlier time when so previously i mentioned that this cartographic imagination of uh, territorializing through military aggression etc etc so bharatam mata with that aggressive lion and the 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 chanda the, the 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 flag which is different which has an om so that means the the, the meaning completely changes you so so uh, bharat mata become becomes a sort of bottle where you can fill in your ideologies and your meanings endorsement bharat mata is endorsing so this is the post nehruvian optimism where like everything is fine yeah so next one too much of endorsement like uh, like a making sitting on the lap so actually the the narrative is very interesting because it is against the nehruvian and gandhian pacifism this is the aggressive militant nationalism you know proposed by subhash chandra bose and which is endorsed oh, kabir ka ek doha hai pahad pooje hari mile to main pooju pahad if i worship a stone if i get the god if i get god then i will worship the the, the mountain let me get a bigger god so similarly if you are holding nehru like this i will keep subhash chandra bos on my lap 
so i'll i'll give more endorsement uh, what is the that the name for our prime minister hindu hriday samrat hindu hriday so so the imagination you have to see that the subcontinent is growing maybe tomorrow it will reach up to uh, north america you know and uh, canada you know <laughs> so it will be our home subject <laughs> so it is it is growing you can come you can see that it going into the southeast asian country so southeast asia as the south southeast asia hriday samrat uh, he is in the making or something yeah. this is a fantastic image that a couple of images i found like you know i found this is a the much coy and you know like uh, you know uh, very coy kind of uh, this is you can see that the new textile ahmedabad limited so there is there is there is an external uh, external uh, suggestion to the women to be coy and clad well so a textile cannot <laughs> a textile company cannot show a woman without clothes you know so you have to use her well clad and that that that, that is flowing like the india india's map you know and this is like the, very this is something like a very ordinary a bharat mata she is at a loss she is actually she was get she was thinking that she will get the uh, five o'clock bus to tirumala eh? and that's gone what to do no auto is ready to come that attitude <laughs> you know that so this is something very cute in the in in that sense bharat mata's various guys so now i'll just read out one sentence and finish it bharat mata seems to appear repeatedly making us aware of the visual discourse that reiterates emblematic status of women in indian cultural life ironically our patriarchal leaders sitting under such emblems like this bharat mata's huge flex boards etc they say make this contrary statements like uh, education spoil women in india divorce cases are increasing because women are educated hmm? educated women tend to divorce peace prevails when women are in kitchen when women are in the kitchen their peace uh, remains if she cooks while menstruating she would incarnate as a bitch no uh, the latest one and so on and still we end the uh, still we in, uh, we end the speeches saying bharat mata ki jai what an irony thank you